From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 70, recorded on June 16th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we'll talk about Paul's column called Don't Trust the Old FDA, Trust Us. Sounds like a bad car dealer commercial, Paul. <laughs> okay, let's go. What? So Marty Macari... Uh, the head of the FDA, and Vinay Prasad, the head of CBER, which is the division that regulates vaccines, wrote a New England Journal of Medicine opinion where they claim that there's been a loss of trust in vaccines. And what's their reason for this? Well, they believe there's been a loss of trust in vaccines because we haven't done placebo-controlled trials when we have every new COVID vaccine each year, which updates it to the circulating strands. And that they believe that by doing a prospective placebo control trial in otherwise healthy 50 to 64 year olds with each new update, that that will restore trust. And while they're right that I think there has been a loss of trust in vaccines, I think that has nothing to do with why there's been a loss of trust. They also claim that limiting the vaccine to 65 and under will restore that trust as well. Um, but first, we'll, we'll cover that. First of all, are they correct that public trust in vaccines has declined? I, I think it has to some extent declined, yes. Um, if you look at national polls, the sense is that, that it has declined, that there are states now that are considering eliminating non-medical exemptions like philosophical or religious exemptions. I think there's a pushback clearly on vaccine mandates. I think the word mandates has become a dirty word. And I think it, it was a consequence in some ways of the first couple of years of the pandemic. I think in 2020, when we didn't have anything, we didn't have monoclonals or antivirals or vaccines till the end of 2020, um, what did we do? We shuttered schools, we restricted travel, we closed businesses, um, we isolated, quarantined, masked, social distance. And I think there were some that really felt that was government overreach. And in 2021, we ha when we had a vaccine and you couldn't go places like your favorite bar or restaurant or sporting event um, or you were fired from your job or place of worship, um, you couldn't go. There was, again, this sense of massive government overreach. And I think that um, that we're, we're feeling the result of that. I think we're feeling the result of that in many ways. I think that it was um, it became easier to vilify vaccines when we did that. Um, and I think we did lose some trust. All right, so how will requiring placebo-controlled studies for yearly COVID vaccines, how is that going to restore that lost trust? I don't think it will restore it at all. First of all, we do know from the last, say, three years, we have done um, retrospective uh, trials looking at people who did or didn't get the uh, updated COVID vaccine to see whether or not it was of value. And, and of course it was. I mean, the, at least for a few months, you were protected against mild to moderate disease. Um, and it was really independent of age risk factor. So you have that information. And also in terms of safety, there's probably been 2 billion doses of this vaccine that have been administered. I would argue we don't know that this, that we know more about this vaccine than any vaccines we've ever had before. So I think we have that information. The other thing about doing a prospective placebo-controlled trial on otherwise healthy 50 to 64-year-olds is that I don't think you can ethically do that study. A, a, you know that the virus is circulating. You know that this vaccine will be of some value. You know that a uh, 50 to 64-year-old, uh, although at not at high risk, is at some risk. And could you really conscience, say, a few people in the placebo group having serious or even fatal disease? I don't think you can conscience that, given uh, what you know about this vaccine already. Well, they have no conscience, Paul, and so they will just rewrite the rules saying you can do, you can withhold standard of care, which is what we're saying would have to be done, right? Right. In terms of, of safety, they make a big deal about this, and you say in your piece that no vaccines have been better studied, right? Right, and they, they've made a very big deal, and Marty McCarry's made a very big deal about you know, myocarditis and, you know, was it hidden from us? They decided to wait on this data 
because they were worried that it might result in some families choosing not to vaccinate their kids. I mean, did we did we not tell people quickly enough that this was a rare cause of myocarditis? And we did. I mean, I was part of I am part of the vaccine uh, related biologic products advisory committee at the FDA. And we very quickly, as soon as it became clear through things like the vaccine safety data link, that this was a rare cause of myocarditis, primarily after this within four days of dose two of the 16 to 29 year old, we knew that very early in the first few months. What's interesting now though, is, is although the Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has insisted on putting a enhanced warning label about myocarditis on, the, um, on these mRNA vaccines, there was a presentation in April at the CDC showing that myocarditis has essentially disappeared. First of all, it was it was always much milder than was the natural infection, but because it's such a large percentage of the population has now been naturally infected or vaccinated multiple times, you really don't see much myocarditis anymore. But yet it was seen in the original trial, so you probably need something on the label, right? Sure, I think that's true, but to sort of enhance the label now, to make it more frightening now, makes little sense given uh, the current epidemiology of myocarditis. So the, the Macari claim that the myocarditis was covered up is just a lie. It's just a lie. And he goes on Fox News and says that. Why? What's the point? To scare people? Why would you want to do that? Prasad also says that COVID vaccines are useless for kids. Is that true? No. And that's been upsetting to me. We talked about that on a previous uh, uh, episode. But the you have... You know that last year that um, there were roughly 6,700 or so hospitalizations in children less than 18. You know most were in children less than four. You know that um, one in five of those children were in the intensive care unit among those hospitalized. You know that about 152 children died. Uh, you know that uh, virtually all were unvaccinated. You know at least half were previously healthy. So mm. do healthy children benefit from a primary series? Of course they do. I mean, I have two grandchildren. Um, when they're six months of age, the maternal antibody that's transferred to them transplacentally will have worn off. And now they are fully susceptible to a virus that's circulating. And although the, the risk of them being hospitalized or going to the intensive care unit or worse is very small, it's not zero. And the, the safety of the vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccine clearly shows that its benefits outweigh its, uh, its small risks. And well, also over... Over five years old, I suppose there's also the higher risk of long COVID, which is partially ameliorated by vaccination, right? They never talk about that. Exactly. So if you've not been vaccinated or you're not, you've not been naturally infected, you're at risk. And so that risk can be mitigated by vaccination. And, and that um, the head of CBER, the Centers for Biologics Evaluation and Research, says that, you know, that children don't need a vaccine. And, and RFK Jr., actually, when he stood up there with Marty McCarry to his right and Jay Bhattacharya to his left and said, we are not going to offer this vaccine for healthy young children. It's just um, awful. As of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. And, and it's the opposite of what he said he would do. He said he would, you know, go along with the ACIP recommendations. He had said that when he first uh, was brought up before the uh, Senate confirmation hearing, that he wouldn't change those recommendations. And that's exactly what he's doing. Well, of course, what he didn't say was that he was going to reappoint the ACIP to do what he wants, right? Right. <laughs> so... Um, What's what's going to be the effect of limiting COVID vaccines to people over sixty five unless you have some issue? Well, and, and if we, so, so the vaccine would be um, would be licensed for those over sixty five. It would be licensed for those under sixty five who were in one of what were twenty three listed high risk conditions. The question is, how about people who can reasonably choose to get that vaccine? One for the issue of long COVID, which you mentioned, or because they're taking care of an elderly parent, or they're taking care of a a child who has cancer. Uh, will they be able to get the vaccine? Uh, will, will insurance companies pay for it? And if insurance companies can't don't pay for it and they can't afford it what's going to be the result of this yeah and of course they also remove pregnancy from the high risk category and and that's even worse we're the only country in the world that doesn't consider pregnancy to be a high risk condition for severe covid what i don't understand paul is we're not talking about mandates okay that's their theme that we overreached okay fine but the, the, when the acip makes 
the decision. It's a recommendation. It is not a mandate. So why not let people still have a choice? I don't understand that. I think what happens is, is that for school entry requirements, you can't require a vaccine for school entry that's not recommended. You can. And so if you don't recommend it, if you say shared clinical decision making, then that eliminates mandates. And I, I really think where they want to go on this is the Project 2025 thing for the CDC, which is the CDC is no longer a recommending body, that we just throw it back to the parent doctor interaction and let them decide. But the minute you do that, you're saying that that vaccines just aren't necessarily important, that you could reasonably choose not to get any of them. And I think that's really where they're heading. Wow. None of this can have a good outcome. No, I think I think what's going may save us, and I'm an optimist. But I think what may save us is that there are groups now, like the American Academy of Pediatrics, which which always make recommendations about vaccines. Those groups are now working with insurance companies to make sure that if they make a recommendation, that that, that also has the same strength as if the ACIP made the recommendation. So it's, it's not really a shadow ACIP because the, AC, the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, does that anyway. But there are other groups like American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology or American College of Physicians. Those groups then can have recommendations that have the strength of an ACIP recommendation because the ACIP has just been blown up and now has people on it that are like um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, anti-vaccine activists and science denialists and conspiracy theorists. Yeah, as you, as you wrote <clears throat> somewhere, I saw an interview with you, the ACIP has now lost the <clears throat> confidence of the medical establishment. For certain. Uh, they've lost the confidence of the medical and scientific establishment. If you look at the people who are now giving advice, these are not people who you would trust. And I think people at the CDC have called me recently and said, you know, I just don't know if I can continue to work here. I feel like we've lost the trust of the American public. And I think that's sad. And hopefully this won't last long. Hopefully we'll get past this phase of our lives. Well, Paul, that's part of the strategy to have Americans lose trust in public institutions in government so that then they can take it over themselves. That's exactly right. I, I think that, you know, when people have asked me to do it, I think Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will, will cause people to lose trust in, in the ACIP or trust in the CDC. I think he was hired for that because he doesn't have trust in, the, the, in, in, in FDA, NIH, CDC. And so that's why he's in the process of dismantling them. So what would happen if this backfires. If we have a huge increase in infectious diseases over the next few years, do you think, uh, what, what do you think the anti-vaxxers will do then, the Prasads and the Makaris? Most people like vaccines. Most parents want to vaccinate their children. I think if it gets to the point where people are becoming more and more scared about the spread of infectious diseases, and we've had sort of a, you know, certainly a, a large measles outbreak this year. We've had a, an influenza outbreak that's bigger than we've had recently. Certainly more children are dying of pertussis than before. That if parents get scared and more and more scared, that they're, they're willing to go to their congressional representatives and say, this is enough. We, we need these vaccines. And, um, and, and because they're the voters. I think in the end, this is a political problem and it requires a political solution. And that's the solution is to get congressmen uh, scared enough that they actually vote their conscience instead of just their politics. Yeah, people do need to write their senators, their representatives and object to the, uh, the effect of vaccines on vaccines that these policies have. It's yeah. interesting that... Um, you know, both Prasad and Makari, you know, they're MDs, correct? Yes. So they have this vague appearance, appearance of being credentialed. But if you look closely, Prasad is a hematologist. Makari is, a, is an oncology surgeon. It has nothing to do with vaccinology. And so, you know, that's, to me, that shows it's a shell game, basically. You know, I think they were picked because they were contrarians. They were picked because they clearly would bend a knee to RFK Jr. I mean, just because you're a pancreatic surgeon or a hematologist doesn't mean that you can't be a reasonable person at looking at data. But I think they've already shown their capacity to be contrary to the current um, thinking about, say, COVID vaccines or vaccination. And um, I think that's what got them that position. I mean, for example, Prasad and you quote him in your article, says, anyone who thinks kids should get COVID vaccines should be fired. That's not how science works. We don't say because you have a different view, we're going to fire you. Let's talk about it, right? But I think that makes you a social media star. 
I think by being outrageous that you get much more attention. But I think being a, the, what it takes to be a successful social media star is very different than what it takes to be the head of CBER or the head of FDA. Absolutely. All right. We will put a link to this column in the show notes. Uh, lots of links in that column. You should go follow them and check it out. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.